And I can cite cases of interrogation where information was gotten. For example, uh, Ali Soufan in the case of the blind sheik. Uh, this is a while ago, but he got enough information so that the blind sheik uh, that bombed that earlier, nine, not the 9-11 uh, bombing, but the one that took place the World earlier. The in 93, right. Yeah, that he pled guilty and is serving a life sentence. Senator Dianne Feinstein joining me now. Uh, Senator, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, you know the intelligence community so well, being the you know, outgoing chair, uh, ranking Democrat on the intelligence committee. Uh, let's talk about the, the relationship between Donald Trump and the intelligence community. He's not getting off on a good uh, basis, having really dismissed with some contempt the need for the presidential daily briefing and saying that the, these are the same people who brought you the uh, Iraq WMD false reporting. Um, what would your advice be to him about well, how my to handle advice to him would be to take the briefings. I think they're extraordinarily important. First of all, they do give you a bit of history. They do give you a context of the problem. And when you do them frequently, daily, every other day, you see changes. You can ask questions of briefers. And that's important because you're going to get an informed view. And the people that brief the president uh, brief him in things that we do not necessarily know on intelligence uh, because the PDF, the presidential daily brief, is something that is for the president only and it is not part of the regular intelligence transmission uh, to the committees of the House and the Senate. So it is very important. And then who briefs is important. Their body language is important. What they say is important. And they are very careful. So I would hope that the president would reconsider um, that there is a history and there is a need of the brief with respect to South Korea, excuse me, North Korea, and what they are with nuclear, with the South China Seas and what China is doing there, with the Middle East and Syria and ISIL and the Russians and the Iranians and the Syrian government. And there is with the history of Russia. And that may be a history uh, of which the president-elect is not fully familiar. And I think in dealing with the country like Russia, a huge power, uh, it is really important that you have the context that a, an intelligence brief uh, gives to the President of the United States. Now he has chosen to be, for his Secretary of State, someone who is really in his own mold, a global business leader, uh, aides describe Rex Tillerson as Trumpian, uh, someone who goes his own way, who doesn't have experience in government, that's unusual for a Secretary of State to designate. But at the same time, it's someone who is very close to Vladimir Putin as a matter of business, who was there six months ago and was criticized for that by the Assistant Secretary of State uh, from the podium for going to that conference in, in Moscow. And also someone who has cut deals with the Kurds and people, uh, you know, com countries around the world. Are these issues that are of concern to you with a nominee for Secretary of State? Well, of course it's an issue. Uh, I certainly don't know this gentleman. Uh, his life uh, working experience has been with Exxon. Um, I'm told he's very well thought of in the business community. But soft power, diplomacy, is a very specific uh, use and the history and the context and what predecessors have done, all of that, uh, you know, to, to understand history is to prevent a lot of the bad from happening in the future. So that's the surprise to me, that there isn't the understanding of the role that fact and history plays in some of these appointments. So we'll see. Um, at least, you know, he's a new book for, I think, most of the Senate because it's very hard to uh, see the CEO of a big oil conglomerate as Secretary of State. But we'll see. He may surprise us all. And the New York Times has an extensive investigation into how the hacking from Russia 
uh, occurred and how warnings from an FBI man to the DNC were overlooked, not followed up by either the FBI or the DNC. And so the Russians had seven months of unfettered access to the DNC uh, computer systems uh, at the beginning of this whole episode. What has this taught us and what concerns well, do you have about let that? Well, let me say what I think I can say. Um, I, I have tried to uh, be able to tell you the number of times I've received classified briefs and from whom, and I'm told I can't say that because it's classified. But assume that that's the case, and assume that uh, a number of top people uh, have briefed a number of members of the Senate and I'm sure members of the House. I can tell you what my belief is. I believe this is an incident of foreign espionage. I believe it's a classic covert operation which Russia has performed before on other countries. I believe it is interference in our election and that I believe it is an effort to dirty up one of the candidates. And that's a quote. Um, and that candidate was the Democratic candidate for President of the United States. It was emails related to Democrats that were released to the tune of 800, 3,000 a day over a period of time. There is no, well, I won't say there's no evidence. Uh, at least I don't see at this time any interference with the actual election process because I haven't had that, that briefing. But with the campaigns, uh, with the Democratic Committee, I do see that. Um, Senator Cardin, Senator Leahy and I strongly believe that uh, there should be a 9-11 type outside examination of this. When I've talked to various Republicans about it, there is a kind of dis disagreement that anything bad happened. For me, it is really an act of foreign espionage and it has to be dealt with. And the most important part is who sanctioned this? How did it come about? How did it happen? And we must know that because, our, in my view, our re relationship with Russia depends on it. Well, there are, there's a lot of public reporting that both the FSB and then the GRU, two separate, one military, uh, one non-military, supposedly, from Russia, were both involved. And you have a former KGB slash FSB uh, intelligence officer in Vladimir Putin. Uh, is, it, is it credible that anything of this nature could have happened without him knowing. I'll say this, it is very credible at this point in time. Without him knowing, I doubt it. But it is very credible that your statement is correct. And finally, I wanted to ask you about the torture, so-called torture report. Are you disappointed that President Obama is not declassifying it, but is instead placing it in his presidential records, which will keep it sealed for at least more than a decade? Um, of course I am. You know, it may not be the most opportune time because individual cases are pending. I've been worried about an effort to destroy the report. And the president, by putting it in his personal archives, uh, presents that from happening and also means that it will be declassified uh, in, I think it's 11 or 12 years. Um, there, there is no question that this report is important for posterity. It is important that leaders in the future read, that they read the 7,000 pages, that they look at the 32,000 footnotes. We don't draw judgments in the report. What we do is report the fact of the effectiveness of this kind of torture. So the people that are now talking about this kind of torture and saying, oh, they want to bring it back, should know that when you're dealing with ideologues, this is not effective. And I very much appreciated what General Mattis said, because I think he's right. And I can cite cases of interrogation where information was gotten. For example, uh, Ali Soufan in the case of the blind sheik. Uh, this is a while ago, but he got enough information so that the blind sheik uh, that bombed that earlier, nine, not the 9-11 uh, bombing, but the one that took place earlier. The World Trade Center in 93, right. Yeah, that he 
pled guilty and is serving a life sentence. So good techniques do work. Uh, waterboarding does not. And finally, when Hillary Clinton came to the Hill for the portrait unveiling of Harry Reid, you took the opportunity to take her out to dinner. Um, how is she doing? Well, we had a very quiet dinner, just the two of us, in my hideaway. And I am extraordinarily fond of this woman. And I think it's fair to say uh, that she's hurting. Uh, she is brave, uh, in the sense of her values, her care, her concern. And as I think all of us know who watch that campaign, uh, it was a very hard campaign for her. The name calling, uh, the email intrusion, uh, the misinterpretation of what she had done with emails, um, 11 hours in front of a committee while she was a, can a candidate. And she stood up to it all. And so I think she has a spine of steel, and I think she's going to come through this fine. But I think this is really a tough time for a wonderful human being. Well, Diane Feinstein, thanks for sharing with us. Thank you Thank very you. much. And a happy holiday to you and yours. Thank you. Uh, that bombed that earlier, nine, not the 9-11 uh, bombing, but the one that took place earlier. The World Trade earlier, Center in 93. Uh, that bombed that earlier, nine, not the 9-11 uh, bombing, but the one that took place earlier. The World Trade earlier, Center in 93.